for keeping up with the most obvious question, I guess. Are you excited to be here at Edmonton Comic Con? Looking forward to it. I'm absolutely thrilled. I've never done a, a Comic Con in, uh, in the UK before, even though I lived in London for eight years and you know, grew up in Dublin and Ireland. So I've never, never done a con uh, this side of New York. Really. So uh, this is very, very exciting. I get to meet some UK fans, some of my UK followers, and uh, and, um, and you know, actually get to meet them as opposed to just sort of being on a panel or something. Actually shaking hands, pressing the flesh. And obviously, I mean, um, Man in the High Castle season three yeah. was sensationally game-changing in a whole lot of different ways. Can you talk about looking back now what you're most proud of when you look at that particular season and, and how particularly for your character things have evolved? Well, I'm certainly proud to be playing an Irish character on the show. Um, there, there aren't that many uh, uh, sort of UK and European characters on the show. So a lot of it's sort of concerned with what happens to you know, America um, after World War II when the, when the uh, Germans and the Japanese so um, to be able to play an Irish character in particular is something I'm, I'm quite proud of. Um, but also I think just the, uh, the journey from um, a situation sort of in the second season where it seemed like the Reich was just rising and rising and rising. Now we have a situation where you know, Juliana and Wyatt and their network are starting to resist which uh, hopefully will lead in season four to something even more proactive and um, put up some, some sort of an actual fight. Uh, so we have that to look forward to. Um, I mean, you not so long ago started being the voice of the analyst Batman, yeah. um, which is obviously like a big legacy of many people before you. Yeah. How is that in terms of um, the response to that? How you go about that in making yourself sort of stand out and um, compared to the traits that have done it before. Yeah, it's one of those weird things. I think I think it's you're going down a blind alley if you try to set out to stand out um, from from such an amazing array of of, uh, of successful actors who have played the role. So <clears throat> what I tried to do is just figure out what I was going to do and try to do it to the best of my ability and uh, rely on that really to to uh, distinguish me from. Any other Batman. Um, I suppose that I'm Irish helped, but obviously nobody wants to hear an Irish Batman, or at least that's what I was told. <laughs> I would <would've> definitely <laughs> <that's what I'm laughs> <doing. laughs> There's one person. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it's it's. Uh, I feel like it's something that's evolved over uh, a period of films. Um, so if we look back at Justice League War, which was my first, um, even though I did some interesting things in it, I feel like I was definitely sort of testing the waters and trying out a few different things, whereas a few films later I feel like it started to started to settle, you know? Um, and even now I still feel like I'm experimenting with the amount of humanity I'm able to imbue, particularly into Bruce Wayne. I mean, what, what sets my Batman apart from others is that he's a father, you know, to, to Damien. Um, and, uh, and that is something I'm obviously you know, able to bring as a father myself. Now my, my son isn't a, a, a teenage mutant assassin, but um, <laughs> he can be a bit of a brat sometimes. Uh, and uh, you know, but he's he's what fourteen, um, and uh, and Damian Wayne obviously is, uh, can be. I mean, now I think we we've evolved to a point now where Damian is kind of um, his allegiances are pretty clear. But to start out with, you know, he was. Uh, Canon, so, um, yeah, I feel like I was able to bring some some fatherly qualities to it, and uh, and um, I suppose just my own unique experience as a as a human being. What's it? What's what's funny also is that I used to play and do voices with my son when he was younger, playing with my voice. Um, I never thought I'd be actually doing it <laughs> and getting paid for it. The real thing. Was that like an Irish Batman, or was that still like you do it now? I was, I was, so you know, I was probably. We were both watching the Kevin Conroy Batman's. So, um, Kevin is hugely influential. I mean, anybody who's, who's heard of, uh, and I would never seek to uh, pretend to be replacing Kevin. I'm, I'm as well as Kevin. You know, and I think there, 
there are so many different, uh, it's not just me and Kevin either, there, there are many other Batman voices, both in the animated world and live action, obviously. And um, I think ultimately that just provides a universe where, you know, everybody can find their, their favorite Batman or their alternative, alternative version of Batman. There's just lots to choose from. But I know online early on I was sort of accused of trying to steal Kevin's mantle. And that's, not, that's not what I was trying to do at all. When you start voicing a comic book character, it's a different breed of, of fan, especially with social media. How do you deal with that, both the positive and the negative? Do you, do you go in and look at the comments on Facebook? or you know, Because there's a lot of talk about different Batman and how they portray them. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Do you, do you ignore it? I kind of dialed it back a little bit, to yeah. be honest. You know, um, once I saw that, you know that that comment like, "Who the hell is this guy?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Wait a second, I don't, I don't need to see this because I've got to go in and record tomorrow. I, I need to feel pretty good about myself." Um, no, and, and obviously there's lots of positive comments as well, but. It's just, if you believe the good ones, you kind of have to believe the bad ones, and then it's like, are you going to respond just to the good ones? And then if I'm responding to the good ones, then I'm just kind of self-promoting, and that doesn't feel right either. And I'm not going to defend myself against people who don't like me, because they can just switch it off. Yeah. So I kind of have dialed back a little bit on, on um, social media. I still like to interact with fra fans, and you know, I'm an enthusiast. I like to be positive about things. You know, especially about things that make me happy or things I enjoy. I don't really have time for the the negativity, and and, uh, and they both go hand in hand, unfortunately, especially on social media. So um, I've just kind of backed off a little bit, and and uh, I mean, I'm still there, still have a presence, uh, but I don't go searching. I don't go to comment sections. <laughs> you know, I don't like go to like hashtag Jason O'Mara because that's just. Uh, that's a world of pain. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, I, you know, and ultimately you have to get philosophical about it. You just go, you know, it's different horses for courses. I mean, it, it's some people are going to love it, which they do, and some people aren't. And they're, it's probably because they've grown up a seminal time in their life when they, when they think of a different voice or whatever. I'm, I'm talking particularly about Batman. But, but it goes for, it goes for um, many of the sci-fi stuff. Um, sci-fi sci sort of shows and, and movies that have done this, um, people have a very uh, strong opinion about this stuff because it matters to them, and that's okay, you know. And it, it matters to me too. Um, I don't personally feel the need to tell the world about you know what I think <laughs> about one film or another, about one version or another. Um, you know, uh, I, I sometimes get upset about certain things like Star Wars movies and things like that, but yeah, you know, I talk about it with my friends and I don't on social media. But some people feel the need to do that, and that's okay. Um, I just don't get much out of it, you know, uh, about, about getting that critical and that negative. So I kind of just backed off. You were one of the few people that's jumped from DC and Marvel. Oh yeah, um, yeah. How, how is it I working? About on, that. <laughs> <laughs> how is it working on, on Agents of Shield and joining, you know, a, a sort of established cast quite late on into a few seasons? Into it? Well, first of all, joining Agent Marvel's Agents of Shield was just an amazing experience because of the people involved. You know, um, uh, yes, it was lovely to get a phone call from Jeff Lowe at Marvel and. Uh, he pitched me this idea of Jeffrey Mace, the Patriot, which is you know something that we hadn't really seen in Marvel. Well, it, it was a character that was generated in the forties. You know, that was when it first started to appear, and obviously had a very close relationship with Captain America, and and had various sort of iterations and versions over the decades. But it, he was someone we hadn't heard from in a long time, and so that was really exciting—the idea of, sort of resurrecting a character like that. Um, but also what they did with it, you know, the sort of the, the double bluff and that he was kind of a weird guy, untrustworthy, manipulating, you know, lied in order to become a hero and then that big twist sort of where he gets to become the hero he always wants to be. Um, and, and we end up, actually we end up rooting for him, we end up loving him, you know, which is, you know, if you watch that first episode where he appears, you, you can't imagine how that's possible. Uh, 
But really what made it special was getting the welcome that I did from, from Clark and Chloe and Elizabeth and Ian and uh, Henry and everybody there was just, um, I wasn't prepared for that. It completely disarmed me. And I don't know if you've ever met those guys. I know they've been over here a few times, but they're just, they are like a family, you know? And uh, there's just a, an incredible sense of inclusion. And um, you really do feel like you're, you're, uh, you're part of it. You're not just a guest, you know? Uh, even though I was very respectful of that it was their set and everything, but um, we really sort of brought into the fold and, and um, made it feel really good about it. So, um, that was an absolute joy. I didn't want it to end, but I'm glad when it did end that I got the death that I <laughs> feel the character deserved because it was pretty, it was pretty spectacular. Uh, and, and again, that was you know that was sort of I suppose it ended up being about seven or eight months <clears throat> of my life on and off. Whereas with a, an animated film doing the DC stuff, that's that's a day every few months, you know, where you go through all your lines, record them. And they'll come back with some animation, and you try to um, maybe match that up. Um, some additional dialogue recording, maybe you have to call it. And then maybe a, a final session where you need to put in all the, the fight grunts and groans. <laughs> and uh, literally, you're, you're in a room going, ugh, ugh, ah, you know, all this stuff uh, for about an hour and a half. You can actually lose your voice doing that. Um, that's probably the most challenging part of it, actually. Uh, so, yeah, very different experiences, um, even though one's Marvel and one's DC, they were completely different processes and completely different experiences. I think looking to the future, obviously fans are very excited about what might be in store for us in yeah. the next season of Man the High Council. I'm yeah. curious, are there areas, um, both in terms of the character relationships and the world that we're exploring, that you would be particularly interested to see the show go into? Yeah, I mean, I, there's loads of things I'd be interested in talking to you about, but can say absolutely nothing. Um, but obviously, there's, as I hinted at, I think, this idea of uh, uh, resistance becoming something something real. I think that's a, definitely an arc and a trajectory that the show is heading in. I think um, this idea of traveling from uh, world to world is something that's going to And I love the fact that the show itself is committed to its um, sci-fi elements. You know, uh, in the in Philip K. Dick's book, that stuff was hinted at, and then as the seasons, as the television series seasons progressed, it was something that kind of became more and more important. And now, it's absolutely integral to it. You know, this idea that the, the Nazis have created this um, this other world machine um, uh, uh, next to this anomaly in the middle of the Poconos Mountains. Um, uh, if you haven't seen season three, see it quickly because I'm spoiling it for you. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, so that's something that's obviously going to be taken into season four as well. So uh, these are all elements that are going to be fully explored. And, um, and I know what we've done so far is looking really good and really excited. <laughs> I mean, obviously, um, talking about integral, I think the really interesting thing about Man in the High Castle is the relationships between the different characters. And yeah. I think particularly your relationship with Juliana um, is quite nuanced and, and um, increasingly important, it feels, as the show goes on. I guess, can you talk about your wonderful co-star and, and why you think that has become a bit of a focal point for the story? Well, Lex is amazing to work with. She, she, um, she carries that. Yes, Rufus has incredible stuff to play as John Smith. Um, uh, as to all the characters, but I feel like Alexa really carries that show. You know, it's um, the, the, she's the driving force of the story. Uh, so she works incredibly hard, uh, both before, during, and after the scene, to um, uh, to make Juliana as strong and alive as she can possibly make her. Um, and I was nervous sharing scenes with her initially because she really becomes Juliana on set. You know, she becomes very strong. Um, uh, uh, both inside and out and uh, I, I wanted to do that justice and I wanted to be a match for her somehow you know even though it's pretty impossible because she's a very special character but I wanted to somehow you know I wanted to bring something new to, to the party 
um, which I think the writers really did create in this kind of Humphrey Bogart, kind of Harrison Ford kind of character, you know, um, which I love playing. But um, yeah, I think I think their relationship is um, yes, there's some romance and some sexual attraction there, but it's almost becoming this sort of uh, meeting of minds. Now look, it's it's not. I appear in season four, so as does uh, Julianne. So I think everybody knows that. So so there's going to be something there in the future um, uh, in season four. Obviously, I don't want to spoil anything, but. Um, put it this way, Liam uh, White's well, um, nom de plume, I suppose you could call it, is that his real name? Um, he's he's holding a torch for her, you know, and uh, so I think I think her, his attraction to her goes beyond just something he's interested in in terms of a romantic relationship. It's he realizes, as other people who have met her realize that, you know, she's she's the key to all of this. That she represents um, a cause that is worth uh, that is worth worth pursuing. That that's basically their only chance at um, some some version of freedom. Yeah. Sorry, can I try not to call it that? We have to wrap it up. Oh, 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 interesting. <laughs>